the agenda today. Seeing none, we'll move on to the docket approval and rezoning requests. Are there any motions? Uh, Mayor. Councilmember DeCamp. Uh, yes. Oh, we're talking about the docket now? Yes. Um, I think you see it on the uh, first reading on the zone change. Um, I uh, make a motion that we um, put it on without a public hearing. Second. Have a motion and second to put item 14 on without a public hearing. Any discussion? Then those in favor, please vote yes electronically, if we can. Just one second. I'm not having much luck, so let's do it orally. Those in favor, please vote aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Any further uh, motions? We'll entertain a motion to approve the docket. Move approval of the docket. I have a motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote. It looks like we may be back in business electronically now, so uh, please vote aye electronically if you support approving the docket. Come on, mine is in. It's ready. All right, motion carries. Takes us down to the approval of the October 23rd summary. Do I hear a motion? Second. Have a motion second that the October 23rd summary be approved. Any discussion? Those in favor, please vote yes electronically. Those opposed, vote nay. That motion carries. We're now down to budget amendments. Floor is open for a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and second. Any discussion on the budget amendments? Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote electronically, please. Budget amendments are approved. Now down to the items of new business. I move approval of the new items of new business. Second. I have a motion and second that the new business items be approved. Any discussion? Councilmember James. I had a question regarding item D. Ned Sheehy was going to come forward and respond. Sure. Um, item D is the um, PSA um, between, I can't, I guess it says, between Urban County Government and Simon and Company. And if, I hope all council members have had an opportunity to read through this PSA. Um, and please, if you have any questions, I believe this would be the appropriate time, or concerns, this would be the appropriate time to address them. And I wanted Ned to be here so that Ned could address um, one of my concerns was what is the relationship between Urban County Council and our and, and this PSA? Uh, the, the relationship is kind of what I had done when I first came in, and I asked you all to join forces with me to get an agenda together. So I'm kind of like the, the point person. The, the mayor, of course, is the main point person, but I'm the the, des, the, the the designee for the mayor, and in as much, I'm the one who collects the information from you all to try to come together with a consensus of an agenda. Okay. Oh, are you finished? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just, do any of the council members have any questions about this PSA? Okay. I, I'm not sure. I, I think the previous, any previous council members may know better as to how this is supposed to work than I do. As a new council member, I just felt as if within the scope of services that the relationship between the person who is um, 
the advocate for the legislative, the federal legislative items, that it should be listed within the scope of services, the relationship between the council and, and maybe this is not the appropriate place to do that, but where do we have a relationship? Where do we have the agreement between you as the advocate and the legislative items? that you would be lobbying for? It's in the, the structure that I had mentioned before where I ask you all to tell me what items you all are interested in and then I report back to you as to their progress. Is that something written somewhere? It's not written. Have? No, it's just that was when I first came in, that's what I said that I was going to do. And that's why we had the meeting where we all sat down together and then there were two follow-up emails uh, asking for your all's input. Okay. And then we also had that the meeting following the General Assembly where I gave the presentation as to the actions that we took during the session. Okay. All right. Mayor, I guess I would ask you, how do we get our information to you as to what we would like to see, Ned, what types of um, federal interest, how do we determine what the federal interests are that he's working with Simon and, and company? Well, I think there are a couple of different questions there. First of all, if you've got things that you want to push on the federal level, then just contact Ned, either in response to those emails that he sends out periodically or alternatively, pick up the phone calling. Uh, because Ned's pretty much the point person in terms of dealing with what's going on in Washington as far as LFUCG is concerned. There are other people that, that get involved periodically, but just pick up the phone and call him if, if there's something during a time of the year other than when he is soliciting your input. Now, um, second, I, I think if I understood you correctly and if I didn't clarify it for me, uh, Councilmember James, but he, the, the relationship is such that the folks in Washington need somebody that didn't pick up the phone and call, and Ned's, that's, that's his function, uh, working both Washington and Frankfurt. So if you've got questions about how he develops our legislative agenda, I'll be glad to try to elaborate on that, or Ned can. Or if you've got another question, I'll be glad to try to answer that. So he does that as your designee or as the Urban County Government designee? Well, uh, I guess as the executive branch's designee, so mine. I mean, you all set policy, and then it's our obligation to go and implement it. So if you all tell us we need to do X in Washington, then we go do X in Washington. And one of the, and that, and I'll defer to someone else to, to ask a question after I ask this, but. One of the concerns when I spoke with Ned about this was, you know, there are 15 council members. I can't talk to 15 different council members about their 15 different issues. That that's not something that, you know, that individually it's better to have a collective voice in what the agendas are legislatively federal that we'll be addressing. And I just wonder how do we get to that collective, collective body? Well, that's what Ned was talking about just a second ago. He sends out these emails requesting feedback on issues that you think need to be advanced in Washington. So the way to do that is to respond to those emails, number one, or number two, if you see something in the paper that you think we need, that's going on in Washington that we need to weigh in on, then you know, pick up the phone and call Ned and we'll talk about it. The difficulty is you know, during the course of the year, there will be probably dozens of things that would be of interest to the city of Lexington going on in Washington. The people at, at Simon and Company need to be in a position where they can pick up the phone and know who to call in order to get our feedback, and, and that's primarily Ned's responsibility. Then to the degree there's a question that needs council input, we come to you and talk to you about it. Okay. I'll, I have more questions, but I will, I will yield to anyone else that has questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Council Member Maloney. Now, I don't have questions on this. I have a question on another agenda. Uh, okay. Then does anybody else have questions on this particular item? Council Member McCord. 
Just a, a little bit of perspective uh, as to where we have come from. Uh, you know, as before, I think Ned just uh, in previous administrations, the council and the, and the administration had no relationship, certainly not as, as good as we have it now. Uh, and the communication line was, was uh, severely severed, shall we say. And so we never knew uh, what agenda was being pushed. And, and is this something that, that uh, as Councilmember James has said, is this the city's perspective or is it the mayor's perspective or the council's perspective and so forth? So I think that, that therein lies the, uh, the questions. And I think that uh, I appreciate the fact that we do have a point person now that is accessible, that is on top of things. And I think what you're hearing and what I would encourage is, uh, is some sort of, of continued dialogue with the council because it is difficult to get 15 people and some care, some don't. Some have one particular issue. Some, like me, are, are watching a lot of different things and in, in, in communication with you. So I think that if you take anything away from today, what I would do is, is continue to kind of ratchet up the, the lines of communication and, uh, and if there's some things that, that you see that, hey, this is a particular interest or this is something coming, um, I would over communicate with the council because it's, it's been kind of a tenuous relationship up to now and, and to have somebody there is, is very good and I appreciate uh, the mayor having that and I understand that you have to be able to respond quickly, but I do think that uh, in the past there's just been no real communication. I think some of us want to want to make sure that we've got that. So I think that's what you're hearing. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, I, I would take it. And I appreciate please, that. Continue, continue to take it to another level. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I would add that we really haven't been very aggressively pursuing the Washington agenda, which is why we needed to have somebody in place there. So we haven't had an awful lot of activity in, in Washington over the course of the last 10 months. I expect that's going to change going forward. Council Member Gordon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm glad Councilmember James brought this up because I also had a couple of questions. Actually, in the past, we have worked as a council to develop a list of items for uh, the mayor's point person to take as a, um, a lobbying effort. And in fact, those of you who were on the councils before remember the meetings we had. We had a council member who was actually in charge of legislative agenda for the council and we came together as a council as a whole to put our legislative agenda together and take it to the mayor. And so I think that has worked pretty well rather than having individual council members shooting you emails about what was important to them, you might get 15 different answers. And so I would hope that we would work as a council together as we have and um, develop some primary issues we could bring to you to take them to this person. That would be the most effective So you prefer the, the meeting to, together as opposed to the emails? Well, in the past, uh, it's, meetings aren't always possible, right. I think, especially if there's some issue that comes up quickly and needs quick action. But um, in general, I think it is possible for the council to have a meeting to talk about some of the big issues that you see coming forward and to get feedback from us. I think that's, that is important. Um, I guess my other question is on, uh, in the scope of services item B, what do you anticipate as, I mean, one of the issues listed here is Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you're anticipating there that we aren't aware of. Is there something, is this just this, an example? This, this is just an example. Just an example. Yes. I mean, this, there are definitely a lot more agencies that we're going to okay. be, other than than just those listed. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. Councilmember Stevens. Mayor, I'm on the list as well. And, and I'm, I'm interested in any further questions with regard to this proposed contract. Yeah, Mayor, I I'm on the list. My name keeps being removed, but I'm on the list as well. Well, do you wish to speak with regard to this contract? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Myers. I think you've already called on Councilman Stevens. I'm sorry, I'm twice. But you've already called on Stevens, that's okay. I just wanted you to know I want to be on the list as well. Okay. Do you, do you want to talk about the contract or something? Yes. Else? Okay. I would like to speak to item Delta. All right, good. <laughs> uh, in the past, uh, 
Mr. James, we have had uh, occasion to pass a resolution for an item that was pending in one House and the other of Congress, and the Council, with collaboration or without collaboration, the Mayor passed a resolution to express our collective thoughts about a certain issue. The Council Planning Committee also is set up to handle matters of legislation, so if it's not some kind of emergency problem, that's a good place to take it also. Uh, my question, Ed, is what about this company? I don't know them. Are they uh, deal with municipal legislation or yes, what? Sir. Can Very you tell us so. a little bit about them? They are uh, actually Louisville's uh, lobbyists. They have a, actually an employee that works, used to work for this company. Then she now is a, an employee of Louisville, but she's still housed with this organization. They've been around since 1987. They deal solely in working with cities, nonprofit organizations, and they are, do collaborative work with other organizations of, that do such work like this, like the Council of Mayors and National League of Cities. And they'll re re represent us, too, before agencies as well as yes, before the legislative body. They, they, and they're also, when, it, when the time comes, when there's the need to pull the, pull the trigger for the mayor or me to go up, they'll tell us when we need to come up. And looking at the income of some of the lobbyists that have been working in Washington in recent years, this seems like a bargain. This is a bargain. Yeah. Especially for the, 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 the uh, concept paper uh, that they propose to us, what they're, that they will do, uh, this is a very good, very good deal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I apologize, Councilmember Meyer. That's okay. I, I was putting my name on this and it kept disappearing and I kept putting it on there. I couldn't understand why it was disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I have a few questions. Sure. I think lobbying is largely about relationships. Yes. And I, I appreciate that you came to us at the beginning of the year and asked for what our priorities might be or what we want you to look out for at the federal level. And then you, is it my understanding, is it correct that this company, you've kind of given them that information, and when those issues come before Congress, they kind of flag them and then contact you and let yes. you know that that issue's coming up? Um, I guess what I would, would ask that you would do is to, and I've talked about this at a local level between us and Frankfurt, that we had somebody in our office that did sort of a bill watch. Type of type of position, and if, if you would like, I would be able to forward you my bill watch. Okay, I, I do create a bill watch. Okay, so you actually proactively look at what's happening in D.C. so that we don't have to continually be watching and monitoring what's going on in D.C. But as, they, as our lobbyists, you look at it and say, these are some issues that are coming up that are going to affect our city or our state. That's what this company would do for us. See, I, in Frankfurt, it's easy enough for me to jump in my car right. and get there. Right. This would be our eyes and ears in D.C. They would tell us when the things that we asked them to look out for when they come forward, they would call me and let me know, and I'd say, okay, it's time for us to go. Okay. Okay. Now, as we move that to another level, with legislation being something that's always moving and always evolving, um, you've got our priorities at the beginning of the year. But as far as that bill watch goes, how does this company know about other issues that are coming forward that may affect our state or our local government here? They are connected with other, as I said, they work with only, the, this company works only with uh, governments and nonprofit organizations. This is their specialty. They actually are tapped into different networks that they, uh, you know, they will be able to tell you when a certain grant is coming to do, you know, when, when it's coming forward. And they will let me know that, and then I would send that out to the appropriate department and if it's something that I know that one of you would be especially interested in, I'd make sure that you knew about it. And if you would like, I could make that available to the entire council. Okay. So do we have a mechanism in place that as issues hit nationally and then things come about in, in D.C. in Congress quickly, are we just relying on the information that we gave this group at the beginning, at the beginning of the year? Or what is our mechanism in I place that we continue, continue to update to get, them on? I still continue to get stuff from different people uh, throughout the year. Okay. It's not just the one time that we, I, we met earlier in the year. Okay. And I, I guess I'd say one other thing is that this council, I think, under the previous administration also had another question that was whether or not we would fare better to have a person on the ground in D.C. as opposed to sort of this almost a reactive to wait for this company to call us and say, this is coming up, now you got to mobilize, 
and respond. Mayor, if you could speak to that, and I know we have financially, it's probably more effective to have it set up this way, but will our outcomes be as well? You know, if you want to try to round up about a half million dollars, I can give you a half million dollar <laughs> legislative uh, agenda watch in, in, in Washington. But this particular uh, group comes very highly recommended. They represent a number of municipalities around the country and have for a number of years. That's about all they do is represent the interests of cities. So I think by virtue of their rather long-standing network of relationships in Washington that uh, they're probably more effective for us right now than if we were to try to find somebody up there. Um, now, if after we work with these folks for a while, we're not comfortable with the results we're getting, then I'd be the first to say, let's try something else. Because I, I think LFUCG has um, a lot of room to grow in Washington sure. with our efforts to seek federal funding for any one of a number of different projects. And um, I, I want to aggressively pursue an agenda there. I think this is the most cost-effective way of doing it. If it doesn't work, then we'll try something else. Okay. If I could just add one more piece. The person that works, that, that re represents Louisville, mm -hmm. that used to work for this company, but are they actually stationed in D.C.? In, in his office. In D.C.? Yes. Do you know how much Louisville pays that person? No, but I could find out. But that, that might be something that we want to do next year is look at actually having that relationship where we've got a full-time employee that's stationed there, so we don't have to do the half-million route, but we do have a person right. on the ground. Right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, if, if I could ask one more thing. We used to have a legislative committee, and I think um, uh, Council McCord chairs that committee. Is it possible that we could kind of – do you guys meet on a quarterly basis or anything? The, the way that was set up was Councilmember Farmer and I had, had uh, shared the responsibilities of that. And again, it goes back to what Councilmember Gordon had said was uh, in, in, in the previous world that we lived in where there was no real relationship between uh, the mayor's office and the council office, that was fairly much uh, a necessary evil that we needed to have. Uh, so when Ned came along, one of the things that he did was he invited all of us to come be at the table and started started doing this. So we kind of rolled that into uh, in, that function into this. Now, certainly, we can we can do that if if that be the case. What I found though, uh, just to be fair, is is that when you say, "Hey, we're going to have a meeting about this this." Um, Sometimes folks can't show up, don't show up, and then you have people saying, well, what about this, what about that? And so what, what I would encourage in, that in my earlier conversation is I think I'd be delighted to work with you from, on the council side as to how can we flow information a whole lot more effectively. Uh, and I think, Mayor, if we do that uh, more and more, I think that that's, that's really what we keep talking around here. How we do it is, is certainly left up to debate, but I think that at the end of the day what we need to do is continually flow a lot of information for those of us that, that do have an interest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further with regard to that item of business? Well, I, I appreciate the questions that have been asked. If I am not mistaken, I think this is the first time this sort of relationship has actually come before the council for your consideration. And, um, I just think that's an appropriate precedent to establish going forward, and, and then if uh, we feel like a change needs to be made later on, we'll make it. All right, now I'll go back to the screen here. Councilmember Maloney. Thank you, Mayor. I got a question on E, uh, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Commissioner Kelly here? I thought I saw it. Okay. R1. Robert. Yep. Uh, my question goes to I understand that Bracktown is a new project that came on in the last couple of years when we got funding from the federal government. 
But was Blacktown involved in 1999 or when you all did the design phase for phase one to have a, uh, the engineer to come in and do a design? Wasn't that already done in 1999? And why, or why was it not involved in that phase one project then? Uh, yes, uh, Blacktown was in phase one, but not Cadentown. Cadentown? Cadentown was not, but Blacktown was in phase but one. But this $84,000, is this for the Blacktown phase one, or is this for the Cadentown? Actually, it's for the, the whole thing, for all the uh, uh, projects that we're working on now. Uh, Wilderness Road, Cadentown, Blacktown, and some of the future projects that are coming up. So Blacktown's already, was it already designed in phase one of the $710,000 back in 99? Yes, yes, it was. And it's going to cost $84,000 to just do Cadentown design? No, no sir. Uh, the $84,000 covers all of the projects that will be coming up, including some of the ones that we're working on now. Wilderness Road, uh, Cadentown, Blacktown, uh, Versailles Road area, um, Lane Allen, um, Old Paris Pike. So they weren't. So those really were not. Have not been designed yet. No, some of them have not been designed. Yes. So this eighty-four thousand will pay for those new designs. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Councilmember Blevins. Thank you, Mayor. I have the same, same issue, same uh, item. I want. If, if I read this correctly, the original contract amount was $128,000. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And we've cumulatively modified this contract to the tune of now, gosh, uh, $600,000, something like that, over a period of 1999 till now. That's going to look funny to some of the citizens. Can you walk us through what are the checks and balances internally that you all go through to make sure that we aren't just increasing the scope of a low bid contract so that folks can be assured that we're rebidding when we need to rebid and so on? Can you walk us through the procedures so that citizens understand that? Let, let me first explain to you, since 19, when we first started planning to do these projects in 1999, uh, at that time we uh, were in the planning process, uh, we, um, we wanted to do these projects, but we, we didn't have the funds to do them, to construct them. Uh, so we started by first planning which areas to be done, and then pick certain ones and design them at that time. But then as the money came in from the Kentucky Infrastructure Authority, from KIA, we, we got the money, then we, got, we started constructing them. Uh, then we start planning to go ahead and, and do some others that we knew needed sanitary sewer service. Um, so a, a, as we as we went, we added design, okay, uh, added to the to the scope of the design, but not uh, beyond what the original planning was to be. So you've not added any new areas on this particular contract. We, I think, Bob. We, yeah, Cad Caden Town was added. That's an okay. addition. So we, you might want to explain to the public why we didn't rebid this. That, I think that would be educational for everyone. Why, why we took some, uh, 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 what, well, instead what of was originally a planning it. contract in 1999 has now become multiple design, con multiple design work items under an original contract. Okay, well, so we've we, had, well, let me finish for a second. Yes. We've had numerous modifications to a single contract that started at 128000 is now 794000 It gives the appearance that we've picked the firm and we're just giving them more and more money. But I know that's not our intent. So I, I want you to explain to us why we're sticking with one contract and one firm over such a long period of time with such a massive change in scope. Well, I think the original plan was to hire a firm that would do the original planning and then do the design for these okay. projects. Okay, that was the intent of our original agreement with them. Okay, uh, but at that time we didn't know how much funding would be available. So as we got the money, we uh, started adding design agreements, not design agreements, but changing 
uh, making am amendments and changes to the, the original agreement to add design. In other words, as we get money to do, for example, Bragtown, okay, then we we ask GRW to go ahead and start working on the design. But there, besides design, there are other issues that, for example, public meetings and 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 some other planning issues. So, so we, we there were other issues besides design, but but that's the way it went. So when we let the original contract, it, it included design as money became available, that and we correct. would amend the contract that is as correct. we go along. Yes. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. I, I got another question on that. Councilmember Maloney. That, I mean, that concerns me. Did, did they, when they bid the pot, did they, was there a number that you all allowed to go up to? I mean, a million dollars or something? Because to me, I, to sign a contract, say, well, when the money comes in, we'll pay you when we, when these projects come on board. But shouldn't, when they did the, the bid process, Shouldn't they have been able to give you a set dollar that we think that won't go no higher than this? Well, first of all, those, uh, uh, this is a consulting uh, engineering services firm. They don't bid. They just, we, we become based on qualifications, based, uh, mainly. Okay. Now, uh, at the time that we started planning to do these areas, to sewer these areas, I don't think like I said before, there was the funding was not available locally to do these projects. Right, I know that. I understand before, that. So we had to look for funds somewhere else. Uh, so we couldn't have at that time, uh, we couldn't have at that time estimate, estimated the, the cost to do the entire uh, uh, county. So we had to start step at it, had to do it a step at a time as money became available. Well, I mean, I understand what you mean when money comes available. I just have a problem why the bid process goes out. How, like, it could, this thing can go up to two or three million dollars. And these guys here, shouldn't there have been a, a number that you all would say, when it gets to a million dollars, we're going to have to bid this thing back out because we can't be giving one company all these money for the next 10, 15 years because they're doing the design phase. If it's going to cost a million to two to three million dollars. Now, what will probably may happen. I, I understand your concern, and, and we may be able to uh, go back and, and put a termination uh, term to this agreement with the GRW and then uh, advertise for other firms when we get more funds. Well, I'm not trying to make that um, policy and procedure for you guys. Today. I'm just thinking, to me, it goes back to what Mr. Brevin is saying in, in the public. It's just We're just giving an open check in time something comes available, you design it, we'll pay for it. And if this thing gets over two, three million dollars, it just really concerns me that we should have a number we stop at and then we start bidding the process back. I mean I don't know how you guys feel about that. But to me, we're just an open door. It's just write a check and go ahead and design something and this could go on for the next ten, fifteen, twenty years with the I mean, could this go on this long with the EPA and whatever happens on that? that these guys can still be doing design phase for us for years to come without bidding this out? No, I think, I think we know the areas that need to be sewered, the ones that are on, on septic tanks now. We know these areas, okay? It's just a matter of uh, uh, making plans how the funding is going to become available. And so we know how much we're going to be doing, but we cannot go ahead and design everything at once. So we're, we're designing I, mean, I, I understand that, and I just have a problem is there should be a stealing limit on how much we bid on these things before we open it up. And I know I'm not an engineer, and I know I may start a lot of pot here, but I think it kind of opens up a can of worms when you start, somebody starts having an open check and therefore they want for the next 15 years. Can I respond to this? You haven't said anything I haven't asked, I assure you. Uh, this first contract, the original contract was 1999. The next year, 2000, was the big change. That was 500 and something thousand dollars. This current change is to finish off one little piece of work, and it's only 80 something thousand dollars. So, you know, I, I, the process we might disagree with, but should have been arguing about it seven years ago, so we didn't like the should process. Should have been bid out when y'all did the 500 thousand dollars. That should have been bid out, and y'all didn't. Well, bid out. And you guys, whoever worked back then, did not do that. That's correct. Thank you, Councilmember Vice Mayor Gray. Perhaps I'm just speculating, but I'm going to come to the defense of the, of the uh, 
of engineering here for a minute. I suspect, though I don't know, but from having some familiarity with contracts like this, I suspect that the engineering assignment for phase one was concept schematics, which allowed then for, and that original contract more than likely provided for a phase two, and at that time, at the original time of the offering and the letting of the contract, phase two was contemplated. So I suspect that I'm only so speculating, but most of the time that these sorts of contracts are let, they're let this way. So it was anticipated at the time. I'd be surprised if it were not anticipated. So I think it's important that we don't give the misimpression that for nine years or eight years that we've been going on with an unlimited scope assignment. Right? That is correct. Right. Councilmember Blevins. Uh, I'd just like to follow up, too. It certainly makes sense to stay with the same engineering firm that you began with that did the, the concept stage, and then it would make sense to stay with them to go into design. Uh, I also come from a contractual background in private practice, and what can happen, and I am definitely not saying this happened here. I want to make that clear. GRW is an upstanding engineering firm. What can happen, though, is someone can low bid the planning phase, and then they get a really lucrative contract long term. That's the danger and you have to be a little careful. So my question was not about this particular one so much as it was, what's our procedural way of making sure that we're getting the best value for our money and protecting other contractors who might want to bid on it? And it sounds like you share that concern. Absolutely. Professional services contracts are slightly different than normal. There's not a bid process. You submit a proposal with a cost and then you select the best one based on the money available. And, that, and that's pretty much, I agree with that process. The part I don't like is change orders, which really, really bothered me. And I, I, I get the same feeling from this group as well. Any further questions on that particular item? Any further discussion of the new business items generally? Uh, Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, item L in the new business uh, needs to be corrected. Um, the reimbursement agreement with uh, C Brothers LLC. Um, we need to strike out from line from the third line, where it says force main and pump stations. Um, C Brothers LLC will be constructing a 21-inch trunk line, which does not include a force main or a pump station. This was a mistake in the uh, synopsis. Mayor, I'll move that we amend item L. Okay. The motion is to amend item L by deleting the words in the third line, force main and pump station. Any discussion of the proposed amendment? Those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by voting aye electronically. Voice vote. All right. We'll vote by voice. Those in favor, vote aye. Aye. Those no, motion carries. Unless there are other items to be discussed, I think we have a motion on the floor that is now amended to approve the items of new business. Any further discussion? Are we ready to have a uh, vote electronically now, please? Thank you. The uh, items of new business are approved. That brings us down to our presentations, and the first one is uh, from the Budget and Finance Committee by Councilmember Stevens. If you'll return to page 50 in your packet, the minutes from the Budget and Finance Committee are there contained. The first order of business was the, the a quarterly report from the Internal Audit Division by Mr. Bruce Sally, the director. He reported on two audits, one uh, for the Senior Citizen Center audit, satisfactory, and a second on the bid and request for proposal process audit. Uh, the auditors went through this and uh, made some minor recommendations but found no problems of significance. The uh, Next item was a review of the budget and brief book. We all received uh, several copies of this small summary of our annual budget, uh, and we reviewed what it contained, 
so that uh, we'd be up to date on that. Uh, there were several small question, uh, small discrepancies which were corrected, and there being no further business, not having our monthly financial report, the meeting was adjourned. Thank you. Any questions for Council Member Stevens? We will move along then. I think we have two presentations today. My sense is that we may have several people here interested in the employee benefits item. Is that what most of you all? Okay. Would there be any objection if we went ahead and dealt with that issue first in order to free folks up? All right. Um, that being the case, Mr. Allen, if you would come forward and we'll ask our friends from the Transportation Cabinet to stand by for just a few moments. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. It's always a, uh, a pleasure to come and address the Council, but especially when I have some really great news. That's always a lot of fun. And something that's very important to, uh, to all of our employees and also to you as Council, uh, employee benefits. Just for uh, a little historical knowledge before we get into it, I, I passed out uh, uh, a small packet of information. I trust everybody has received that. Uh, the current medical plan that we have consists of two carriers. Humana, which has 80% of our employees, and Aetna, which has 20% of our employees. There are two basic plan designs, um, a preferred provider network and like a, an HMO type network. There are three tiers that the employees can enroll in, which is the employee. We have 1,271 employees in that group. The employee plus one, which is 437, and then family coverage, which is 768, for a total of 2,476 employees currently enrolled in our medical plan. The dental plan, we have one carrier, Delta Dental. We have two basic plan designs. And in this plan, we have four tiers which is employee, employee plus one, employee plus children, and family. The total in that is about 2,590 employees. So we have a few more enrolled in dental than we do in medical. In January of last year, based upon our collective bargaining agreements, uh, we're required under those agreements to establish a benefits committee. Uh, whereby at that point police and fire could have some input into what we were looking at as far as recommendations on employee benefits. We decided to kind of expand that view and ask uh, a variety of our employees to uh, become members of the committee so that we had the, the widest perception across government what was important to our employee groups. The Benefits Committee, and that's the reason for its forming, but the Benefits Committee, uh, the membership, I did pass it on. I'd like to recognize them today for the hard work that they did in coming up with the proposal that we're going to be giving you today. It's David Lucas, representing public safety in E911. Brian Markham, representing purchasing. Billy Van Pelt, representing the mayor's office. Rick Bowman, representing CSEA. Chris Ward and Chris Bartley, representing FIRE. John Taylor, representing Community Corrections. Hilton Hastings, representing Police. Paul Schoninger, who represented the Council Office. Susan Combs, who represented Police and FIRE Pension Fund. Candace Wofford, who also participated from her purchasing role. Tracy Stevenson, Alice Phillips, and Kim Nesbitt from Human Resources, and Mary Lyle, who is also our RN and wellness individual. Those were all on the committee and did uh, a, a lot of really yeoman's work to get uh, uh, 
uh, work done on this on this uh, project. When we met with the committee, we had certain goals that we established. Uh, one was to create more differentiation between the plan design. The medical plans look very similar. The dental plans certainly look similar. Um, to enhance our benefits in response to employee comments and suggestions. To control our costs and save money, which is almost, when you're talking about health care, an oxymoron and to offer the employee plus children's option for the medical plan as well as the dental plan so that there would be four tiers in both. Those were our goals and objectives. We had a big challenge. Uh, LFUCG has not had a rate increase to our employees in three years. While at the same time, regional health care costs, just in this this region have gone up an average of 44 percent in the last three years. And I know it won't surprise Council um, who picked up most of that 44 percent as far as the employers are concerned. It was the employees. Employers just can't continue to, to keep track of that kind of cost. As standard procedure, we put out a request for proposal. Now, I brought a visual aid. I don't know how many of you had a pleasure to look at these things. That's one response to a request for proposal on the medical plan. We had a pretty good response. The, um, under the medical plan proposal, we asked for three. We had medical, we had dental, and based upon a, an internal audit report, a third-party administrator, potentially for auditing purposes of claims. To the medical providers, we, we had to make sure they understood the, the ground rules, that we're a self-funded plan, that we pay administrative costs, which is a term called ASO, administra administrative services only, and the actual claims cost. When we put the RFP out, based upon the committee's suggestions, we asked for the bids to reflect certain things for the best deal that we could get. In other words, what if you were the single provider? You got the whole book of business. What would you charge us? Um, what if you were the single provider and also got our pharmacy business? So we asked our providers to respond and give us uh, a, a, dip, a variety of different scenarios so that we would have the most suggestions that we could possibly make. We asked the, uh, the providers to respond on a, uh, what, they, what they consider best practices for a consumer-driven health plan, which is a, the new uh, programs that, are, that uh, you'll see out there with uh, health spending accounts. One of the largest concerns that we had was coming from our uh, retirees, our police and fire retirees, who felt that there was not sufficient access for uh, some, of the, some of the providers that we currently had. We also asked our uh, dental responders to come up with a, more of a best practices plan as well, uh, considering we had a lot of feedback from our employees that the cap on the annual cap was a thousand dollars and they spent it too quickly so we wanted a a little alternative plan design the responses to the rfp were good to the medical plan we had five aetna anthem blue cross and blue shield bluegrass family health care humana and united health care to the dental plan, we had four responses. Aetna, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Delta Dental, and Humana. For the dental plan, we uh, also asked for some changes besides some, you know, the general best practices. 
One of the, uh, the responses that we had from our employees was um, lack of coverage for certain things. And that, uh, those two items, the largest items were periodontal work and a big one, orthodontia, for both uh, child and adult. So we asked for that as well. Um, the committee did review the third party administrator information we got, but uh, are not prepared to make any suggestions to the council or to the mayor and the commissioners at this point in time as far as go forward with that. Uh, but that could be in the future. The committee analyzed the RFPs, and like I said, I'm sure you <laughs> can all appreciate how much time it takes to go through multiple RFPs like this to get uh, uh, the information that we need to make decisions. Uh, we presented a variety of uh, suggestions and options to the mayor and the commissioners for feedback. And today, it's my pleasure to present the combined efforts for your review and approval to, uh, to approve a, uh, a future blue sheet that will come across for the mayor's signature. What we're, uh, the committee is uh, recommending for medical, the use of one local provider instead of two, and that provider is Humana. We want to offer three distinct medical plans. A high-end, we're going to call it the platinum plan, that is a, it offers enhanced benefits to what our current plan provides. Examples of the enhanced benefits would be instead of $20 copays at the doctor, it's $15 copays. Um, the network is terrific. Every hospital in the state of Kentucky is in this network. So going outside a network is, is going to be a little tough. So that's the platinum plan. Uh, our current plan is very similar to what we're going to call the gold plan. And then we're going to offer a high deductible health spending account uh, type consumer driven health plan that we're going to call the silver plan. These are very, very unique. I've given you in your packet sample of um, a comparison of what these kinds of plans, what they're going to offer. And it, they're incredibly competitive. Um, the silver plan is very interesting because it, it is a health spending account plan. Uh, the beauty of it is that we absolutely cap our costs as a government. Uh, to the contribution of $500. The a gold plan, as I said, is, is very similar to our current plan, and the platinum plan is um, uh, much more enhanced. Under the medical plan, we are also going to offer the fourth tier, as I said, the employee plus children. Uh, this is for two purposes. The first purpose is to assist uh, our single parents who are currently enrolled in family plan and paying a high-end family cost um, when, they, when they don't need to. Uh, children, for medical purposes, and medical purposes only, are cheap. Norm, you know, they, they have, they're costly in a lot of other things, but when it comes to the actual medical side, they're not that expensive. So we can offer a plan at a lower, for employee plus children, at a lower rate than employee plus one. The employee plus one being an adult. So we're able to offer a lower rate by offering that tier. Um, we did, before we made the recommendation, we did do a survey. We sent a survey out to every, all, everyone who was enrolled in family coverage and asked them if that kind of a tier at a lower rate would be beneficial to them. And over 25% of those responding 
said yes, it would. So we know at least 25 percent of our currently enrolled family group would migrate to the employee plus child plan. One of the, uh, the enhancements to the medical plans will be the addition of a vision benefit. Currently, we have quite a few people enrolled in IMED, which is our vision plan. The exact same coverage under IMED will be incorporated in the Humana plan at no cost to the employee. We will also continue to offer IMED if you do, the employee wants to just enroll in that and not enroll in the medical for six more dollars. But it saves every employee six dollars who are currently enrolled in IMED now. We've also uh, expanded based upon feedback that we received the durable medical equipment uh, uh, benefit to include hearing aids uh, up to a, a maximum annual of $1,400. So those are two key enhancements to the plan. Probably the biggest recommendation is to maintain or lower the average employee contribution rate. Basically, based upon what the mayor and the commissioners and the co committee has suggested, we are be going to be offering an enha enhanced plans at lower employee contributions. I mean, that's almost unheard of these days in, in, health, in health benefits. Um, under the dental plan, as I said, we are going to continue our current 100% coverage, $1,000 cap plan for at least a year. But we'll be offering uh, another kind of plan through Delta Dental that uh, is more standardized in the industry. 100% preventive coverage, 80% for certain of the, you know, the fillings and that kind of work, and then 50% 50 50 on major uh, dental coverage which includes periodontal and also adult and child orthodontia, which is very unique. Um, and the cap, annual cap on that is $2,500. So it's two and a half times what uh, the current level of coverage is. We are also going to, uh, based upon how Delta Dental came back, because it's interesting when they thought they might lose the business, um, they came back at rates which were phenomenal because they were fully insured. We were currently under the same kind of um, program as we were with Humana, which is the ASO, the administrative services cost, which is a per employee per month cost, plus we were playing claims. Well, Delta came back and offered us rates which were currently lower than what we were offering now, fully insured. So we will save all of the ASO uh, money that we paid last year to Delta, plus the difference in the claims dollars uh, between the contributions and the actual claims. I have given you uh, a brief example of what the current contributions would be for the rate comparisons, and these are rough averages. They're, they're blended rates. But under 2007, the employee rate was right around 300, employee only, was right around $317 a month. The proposed gold plan rate for single is $300, so it's going down. The employee plus spouse was 566. The 2008 recommended rate is 540, so it's going down. The employee plus children rate is 520, so less than the employee plus one. And the family rate uh, was right around 690, and under the gold plan it will be 650. So it also is going down. The dental insurance for the employee, uh, average last year was $29.50, and remember that was ASO plus claims, so it's much more costly. Fully insured, it's only $28, so it's going down. The employee plus spouse is going up slightly. The employee plus children is going up slightly, again, 5 or $6, 
and the employee plus family is going up uh, $6 a month. So not a lot of rate increase, but a lot more benefits and uh, a lot of enhancement. From the projected savings perspective, which is almost, again, my hat's off to the committee. A lot of it is negotiation skills uh, and Humana's willingness to work with us. But we've uh, been able to negotiate a significantly lower administrative charge per employee, which will result in an estimated savings to the plan of approximately $497,930, or about half a million dollars. Based upon the survey results of those 25% of uh, employees migrating from the family to the employee plus children, uh, that subsidy that we'll save is an additional $475,225. And by going to the fully insured dental plan, uh, we'll also save that just using last year's administrative costs and the claims paid, the difference between the claims paid and the contributions, which is the costing, that will be approximately $225,575. I guess in summary, I'd like to thank the Benefits Committee, the Mayor, the Commissioners, in being able to offer an enhanced medical and dental plan at substantially the same or less employee contribution rates with an estimated savings of approximately $1.2 million to LFUCG. And if you'd like to see where I keep the magic wand, I'll be glad to show you at another time. Thank you. Uh, it's our hope that Council will approve that forthcoming request. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. I think there are a few questions here. Council Member Stennett. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Allen, thank you for coming to us today with uh, this information. I know. Uh, uh, it's a lot of hard work, as you know, my office, that's what we do, is one of the benefits we offer as a group health for our clients. And uh, I can tell you, working with uh, the many carriers here in, in Lexington, which are now three, uh, it's still not an easy task, uh, what you have to go through. Just have a couple of questions uh, regarding the plans that we ended up with. Um, what criteria did, did the group use, specifically the top one or two or three, to come up with just a Humana-only plan or, or one provider? What was the... <clears throat> straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Was it price? Was it the uh, benefits offered? How do we get to those three plans? Great question. It was uh, based upon the RFP responses, which said, uh, outlined exactly what the plan designs were, as you know, and wanting to know, can you meet these plans to de plan designs? It's also geo access, as you know, which is absolutely incredibly important as far as number of facilities, number of doctors available within a certain geographic area and radius. And the third piece, obviously, is price. So the other two, or other three, Anthem, Aetna, and Bluegrass Family, did they not meet the criteria? Anybody not meet the criteria? There were several, and we have all that data. Purchasing has, a, has put all of that together and is, will obviously make that available to you if you would like. Uh, and also, one of the, the, the largest pieces, council member, was, um, and I only say that because I, I, I don't have the responses right at my fingertips, but one of the big issues was trying to work with the HSA, the Consumer Driven Health Plan, which we think is vitally important to make sure that we offer to our employees an alternative to the high cost of health care and putting health care in their hands to manage. Um, and we're able to offer that kind of a plan at a much lower rate. As you can see, we're able to offer single coverage under the silver plan, the consumer driven health plan, for only $250 a month. Um, and remember the benefit pool that the employee receives currently uh, with LFUCG is $355. So um, we wanted to make certain that the providers would be able to work with us uh, on a consumer-driven health plan, and not everybody is. How hard did you negotiate the HSA portion, the health savings account portion in the plan? Because it, to me, you know, if I'm offering this to one of my clients, $2,200 deductible for a $80 a month savings does not exactly excite me. Um, so how hard did we negotiate with that? Uh, because we can get it down to 1500 out there. 
Some of it, as we understand, is driven by statute as far as minimum requirements for a, for a uh, uh, consumer-driven health plan. A high deductible plan has to have a minimum deductible. And 2200 was, we, was what we were informed is our minimum deductible. Uh, if you do look at it from the perspective of costing, council member, uh, at $250, that leaves the extra $100 in the benefit pool. Additionally, LFUCG will contribute, based upon the current plan design, $500. So that leaves that, that's total dollars potentially into the HSA account of the employee of $1,700 on a $2,200 deductible, which is only a, a potential exposure of $500. Now, as you also know, these kinds of plans are not for everybody. No. That, you know, they're designed for either people who are very, very healthy or are very, very not healthy. Right. And uh, so from that perspective, that money, council members, stays in the, the employee's account. That doesn't, if they don't use it, that does not revert back. That stays in the employee's account and rolls over for the following year. So that if, if they're not... Um, if they don't have any major issues, council member, that first year, their exposure is probably $500, and then the following year, it's almost nothing. So it's designed, um, as, as I say, what, with what we were told was the minimum requirement for high deductible health care. And if you, if when you, you say it's, that's what you were told, based on being a government agency? Yes. Because I know in the market, there's, there's much lower options as well as they, we do include the prescription drug coverage, the same as what it is in a PPO. And I see here it's not. They're paying well, the negotiated rates on the drug. So. That's correct because under the um, Consumer Driven Health Plan, again, the HSA, they can't be part of our, if they're paying the bill, they can't be part of our, because Humana doesn't hold the pharmacy, we have that carved out. So because of that. That's what, that's what I want you to make the distinction. Pharmacare is separate from this. That is absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, and it'd be nice if we could get them to work together, but, <laughs> but right. they won't. Well, you, you spoke a little bit earlier about the numbers here, about how many people are in each of the levels or tier or classes. Huh? You said there's about 2,400 people enrolled in our medical insurance. Does that include all the outside agencies that also participate? No, sir. So where are they and who are they? I mean, I think we need to know who else is uh, taking part of this plan because it does affect our overall rates. Uh, the more people we include could have an adverse effect on our overall rates. And it is good to see, as you said, we, our rates dropped this year. And I wish I could say it for every one of my clients, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not happening right now in the market. No, it's not. But how many other – can you give us a list of how many other people are also using this plan? I absolutely can. As well as – is it are these the rates also for the retirees in the police and fire department? Are these the rates for them as well? Uh, the rates will apply to the police and fire retirees, council member, with the exception of the silver plan. The HSA will, will not be offered to the uh, – the administration of that would just be a little too difficult. But the gold and the platinum plan would absolutely be offered to our retirees. As I, well as the outside agencies. As, as well as the outside agencies, absolutely. Uh, and I do have a listing of those outside agencies that I will absolutely make available to you with their enrollment numbers. Okay, very good. And then one last question. I know there's a couple other people that want to speak. Uh, who are you going to have set up available to help on the HSA? Or is Humana coming in? That's a, that is a great question. We have uh, scheduled, based upon approval, the uh, uh, a week of training at a variety of different uh, locations to make certain that our employees are well educated on the HSA. I really believe that the enrollment in that will be low the first year until people get more comfortable with, with what, it's, what it is and if it will work for them or not. So will Humana be coming in and doing yes, that? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that part of our deal? Yes, sir. With him? Very good. Thank you. Council Member Crosby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as Kevin actually asked a couple of my questions, but I just wanted to clarify currently how many or what percentage, I think you said it at the beginning, and I just want to clarify, I think I heard 80% of LFECG employees are currently Enrolled in Humana? That is correct, Council Member. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Member Court. Thank you, Mayor. Michael, thank you very much. Absolutely. And I want to thank the committee members. I have sat on this committee and read those thick books, and I appreciate that they did it. 
it's a lot of work. So, um, I had a few questions. Um, first of all, when is open enrollment? The based upon again approvals and because uh, we're in a tight time crunch is the first week in December. So the first full week, okay. Um, now, uh, how many employees do we have who are also on Medicare? Do you know? Under the uh, yeah, under the uh, police and fire pension, we do not require Medicare enrollment. But we do have approximately 230 to 240 who are Medicare eligible. And part of the plan that we're looking at is to uh, offer a, a Medicare Advantage plan through Humana to replace the current uh, Anthem plan, which uh, is not well received by our retirees. Okay. But we don't have any current employees who are... Medicare eligible? Are they all retired? Um, and if you're I, 65, you yeah. can be enrolled with Council member, with that's Medicare. a good question. I do not know. Well, my, the reason I'm asking is whether if we have current employees who are Medicare registered, can can we be the secondary automatically, we, or we, do, the, do we have to be the primary insurance? Currently, insurance? currently under the uh, police and fire pension plan, mm -hmm. the, that retired group. It's not, it has never been uh, pushed that we require Medicare enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, it's driven by statute, and we are looking currently, we're looking at um, what our options are mm -hmm. under that plan as far as uh, getting LFUCG out of being primary. Mm -hmm. Under our current uh, employees who are not retired yet, mm -hmm. We have never, uh, to my knowledge, required uh, medic it, once they become Medicare eligible that Medicare becomes primary and we're secondary. It seems to me it would be an advantage to us, since we're self-insured, if we have Medicare employees for Medicare to pay first and then us to be the secondary. That I would require know, Medicare enrollment of mm -hmm. both, as you know, mm -hmm. of A and B, and there's a fee associated with Part B. So it would just depend whether we picked that up, didn't mm -hmm. pick it up, you know, okay. and that's part of what we're looking as far as okay. options. Currently, for single coverage, uh, as you know, I, obviously with Medicare, it's um, rated by the amount of income mm -hmm. that you make. Uh, so with our retirees, it's a lot easier because we know pretty much what the, the cap is on that. And currently, it's running right at $93 a month okay. for uh, Medicare Part B. So there's that, that dollars are out there. Who's going to pick up that okay. if we require Medicare enrollment? Okay. Now, um, on your um, chart, your uh, LFUCG health insurance comparison, January 1st, 2008, this, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. I had a couple questions. On the left-hand column, a little more than halfway, you have ER visits, and in parentheses, you have life or limb threatening only. Um, does that mean that um, there will be someone auditing all of the ER visits? Would that be Humana to determine if the visit was a life-threatening visit or one that was not? life-threatening? What does that mean? What this means is that we're trying to encourage emergency room visits only when they're absolutely necessary and not just for uh, visits that could be uh, better handled at an urgent care treatment center or something similar to that to discourage people just going to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the issue of um, admission. So if the emergency room visit also involves life or limb, which also implies not just emergency, but potential admission to the hospital, then there's no charge for that emergency room visit. But, but there isn't, but this is simply put on here to discourage everyday visits. That's correct, Going Council to Member. the emergency room. There won't be any audit or any 
checking on that. No, because so you're going to pay it. The only good part is if you if it is significant and serious and you are admitted, then there's no charge. Mm -hmm. Now, at the bottom of this um, form, I wanted to ask you about the total pool credit. Is this what yes, we used to call the benefit pool? It is exactly that. So the uh, total benefit pool for all non-bargaining employees is 355.74 that's correct monthly and so from that employees will choose to pay for insurance retirement however they want to use it that's correct council member that goes back to uh, the ordinance that or from the days when we merged the government where we were required to uh, to pay for single coverage and, and on the bargaining, I noticed that the corrections are 405.74 and police and fire are 530.74. Now, um, it, uh, with those amounts, do police, fire, and corrections have any different options for where to put their benefit pool, or are, do they have the same options as all government employees? Same options which are health insurance, retirement, anything uh, else? All numbers of options with Colonial, the whole, with absolutely, there's the whole a whole gamut of, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, my last question is, did the committee, I know that in the private sector, um, many companies are looking at smoker versus non-smoker uh, rates. Did you look at any um, smoker versus non-smoker rates? It was discussed and um, reserved for potential uh, changes or recommendations down the road. Okay. Uh, in coordination more with our wellness, mm -hmm. we, we wanted to make certain the committee felt it important that the message we were sending was one more of a uh, carrot instead of a stick and to take a look at a much more holistic approach so it wasn't just like smokers will pay more or less. Mm -hmm. so. I think a lot of companies now are doing that. Yes, uh, they are. Councilmember Stennett also would probably know that. They're offering different rates for non-smokers as opposed to smokers, mm -hmm. recognizing that the health risks are greater, mm -hmm. potentially greater, with smokers. They're actually approaching um, uh, a wide variety of different areas as well as smoking, mm -hmm. you yes. know, from a wellness perspective, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when we do it, we should do it from that perspective so it doesn't look like we're just targeting a but certain group. Smokers. Yeah, a certain group of individuals. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Maloney, you were on here and you evaporated. Was that because you decided you didn't want to ask a question or it was? That's right. Significant? <laughs> You're right. Okay. All right. Councilmember Myers. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you for coming in today, Michael. Sure. You did a fantastic job. Thanks. Let's have you, a sir. couple of quick questions. One is um, can you complete a cost benefit analysis with respect to requiring, requiring Medicaid or Medicare? We will absolutely look into that based upon Councilmember Gordon's. Absolutely. What it'll mean is target just figuring out who under our current enrollment. Uh, is eligible at 65, absolutely. Okay, and then you'll bring back your recommendation? Glad to. Okay, thank you. And the final one is, uh, last year, in the past budget cycle, we um, budgeted a 75% subsidy for all city employees with respect to joining the YMCA. Is there a way of doing a cost analysis to see if a certain percentage of employees enrolled in the Y that would drive down our cost for Healthcare. That goes in hand in glove, sir, with exactly what uh, Council Member Gordon was talking about and the kind of the approach we were thinking about taking from a more holistic approach sure. as far as wellness is concerned. And if you're involved in those kinds of programs, what, you know, there is obviously a benefit in, in people living healthier lives, uh, but exactly quantifying that would we can sure take a look at it, absolutely. Okay, and that was one of the driving forces behind the council budgeting that money, was not just so that it would be cheaper for our employees, right. but that we get that other benefit out of it as well. And long term, it's, it, it's a great right. program. It should have great effect. I know that you have long term a lot of goals for a wellness.
program that's really holistic for our government. At some point, will you bring something back? Are you looking at this budget cycle to bring back some proposals on how you want to increase that? We're actually targeting that whole group uh, from an occupational wellness organizational piece. Okay. And yes, sir, we will. Uh, I'm speaking for Mary Lyle, but I'm sure she will be thrilled to come and address council to, uh, to talk about the, those programs. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and I thank your committee's, rework, your committee's work as well. Thank you. Mr. Stennett. Just to follow up, you, you touched on I wasn't going to bring it up today, but the Medicare cost analysis mm -hmm. that you're going to do, you're going to do for the employees and retirees? We're already working on the retirees because we knew that. Um, but uh, and you say working, I mean, it requires a state statute. Uh, we've, we've got, well, the, it's, that, driv it's driven by statute. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the law department is looking at our options, council member, as to whether it requires uh, a, a legislative amendment to require that Medicare piece or not. Because it simply says that we have to uh, supply, we have to supply a program but we also have to fund it based upon what the single medical coverage is for our current LFUCG employees. So there's a wee bit of leeway, but requiring Medicare literally might require a legislative amendment. Well, you but, hit what I was going to touch on. You know, to, to give them a lesser benefit or a lesser amount just so we can save some money, I would caution you. I'm not sure that's the policy that this body would want to take. You know, giving them the same benefit that we're giving to a single employee would be where we need to stay at. And furthermore, you talked about adding the nine hundred dollars for Part B, but don't forget about Part D either, uh, which is the prescription drug benefit. Would the, have to be uh, too. the and that's great. The um, the current proposed Humana um, supplemental plan has a fantastic pharmacy benefit that doesn't have any donut holes in it like Medicare Part D. Uh, they get the absolute benefit of the uh, Humana network on discounting. And, council member, you wouldn't believe this plan. Um, you would. It, it's, I had to keep reading it several times. When they reach their maximum out-of-pocket for, like, specialty drugs or something like that, at $4,000 a year, their costs go down. Right. Well, they can also you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So They can also go to Walmart or Kroger, as we're encouraging people to for $4. Absolutely. I mean, well, and they, to death. and they can do that, too. You know, so yeah, uh, we've we've taken into account. Well, when you get that information from our law department, I hope you'll share it with the council and keep us in step going glad forward. Glad to do it. Glad yeah. to do it. Thank you. Absolutely. Councilman Beard. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Michael, one other thing, which is the, probably the other side of the coin, and that is um, the claim paying history of Humana versus some of the other carriers and and. Was that analyzed, or do you all keep track of complaints and such uh, uh, as you go along through the years? Yes, sir, we do, and uh, that was also part of what the third-party administrator function was going to be doing, council members. So we haven't let go of that yet. It just seemed like we had enough to do with just the plan designs and making some of those changes before we did the third party administrator. But yes, sir, that is still on our radar screen. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference what the price is if they're not paying out any claims uh, or delaying for some significant length of time until they wear people down. It doesn't mean anything. And that's customer service we need to continue sure. to work on. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Any further comments or questions? And thank you very much, thank you, Mr. Sir. Allen. And we'll proceed now to the presentation on the uh, Newtown Pike widening. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Members. My name is Bob Nunley, and I'm with the Transportation Cabinet. And today we're here to uh, present to you a uh, the project, uh, the widening of Newtown Pike from New Circle Road to I-75. And I'm going to, we've uh, hired a consultant to work on this project, and I'm going to turn the mic over to their project manager to let him present to you this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. 
My name is Charles Raymer. I'm here on behalf of the project team and the project manager, Bob Nunley, to provide you early information on the Newtown Pike project to improve that section from north of New Circle Road up through the I-64, I-75 interchange. We're currently coordinating with a project on either end of the project. There is an interchange improvement project for New Circle Road, Newtown Pike currently underway. There is also a design build project north of the interstate that is currently moving quite along, uh, quite aggressively. This project, as we noted, basically is from the north limits of the New Circle Road interchange through the I-64, I-75 interchange. The, obviously, the, the driving force here is the traffic on the road. Uh, the existing traffic is about 41,000. Average daily traffic, uh, people moving on that route each day. That volume is projected to increase in the design year 2030 to about 66,000 vehicles a day. Uh, just for an example, the Citation Boulevard extension will add a considerable amount of additional traffic to the stream with the ultimate connection on over to the east. That projection is in, is intended to provide or projected to provide about an additional 380 turning vehicles in the design hour for Newtown Pike. Uh, the projected truck volume, which is a significant volume on this route, is about a third of the traffic stream today and projected to be that in the design year as well. We are looking at four basic things, four basic purposes for this project. The first, obviously, is capacity, the need to address that increase in traffic. We're looking at adding an additional travel lane in both directions. The second and very important, or the next very important thing, is safety, which will be emphasized throughout the development of the project. We're going to retain the grass median that you have through most of the length of the project. We're looking at improving the turn lanes at the various intersections along the route. We're also looking at providing an access management plan that addresses some of the existing access, particularly in terms of left, turn, left turns through the median and also some of the turn lanes on the outside into the development that exists within this corridor. The next thing we're looking at is pedestrian uh, and bicycle accommodations. There is a proposal included with the project to add a eight-foot bike lane on both sides up to the Aristide Newtown Pike uh, intersection and also provide curb and gutter along the outside with a berm that will allow for sidewalk construction. Right now it looks like primary emphasis will be on the east side of the road for pedestrian accommodations because of the type of development you have out there today. And the last thing which is very, very important on this corridor is the aesthetic character of the, of the existing road and we're trying to reflect that into the actual development of the project at this preliminary stage. Uh, we're going to be looking at minimizing impacts to landscaping. We know that we're going to affect the landscaping within this corridor and we have a uh, partner on our team, Sherman Carter Barnhart, to assist us in identifying things that we can do to avoid some of the existing landscape, preserve some of that, and also enhance some of the same areas that we're, we're, we know we'll have to take some trees and shrubs and other features down. The typical section for the project, this shows a 32-foot raised meeting that's in the vicinity of the Citation Boulevard intersection. At that point, we're proposing dual left turn lanes in the median. The bulk of the project will have a 20-foot raised grass median, very similar to the median that you have throughout most of the length of the project. The median on either end flares out slightly through the two interchange areas. Projects in a very preliminary design stage. We've had preliminary meetings with the department to review some of the details looking at the intersections which are highlighted on this, this um, schematic of the plan view. We're also looking at part of this trying to decide what we can do with the median in those areas where we have existing openings. Current schedule for the project. I know that most of you are going to be very concerned about the timing of this relative to the World Equestrian Games at this stage. The project is not anticipated to be underway until after the 2010 World Equestrian Games. Part of the reason for that is the fact that the current six-year highway plan does not include funds for the right-of-way utility relocation and construction phases. The department is working on that in terms of the six-year plan adjustment that the legislature will be acting on uh, come this January, February. 
Uh, we expect after Thanksgiving that we'll begin work on the final details of this project and also uh, come back to you later on next year to talk about what those details might include on the project. Some of the general concerns that were identified in the original advertisement for this project and that we have uh, identified through our wor early work on the project and some of the contacts that we've made uh, are listed here. I'm not going to go over each one of them. One of them that is highlighted here is safety, and obviously that's an issue that has been raised by a number of people, the need to pay attention to the safety of the road and try to do something that will accommodate some improvements with respect to that. It's also on the list on the left side, uh, including the list near the bottom, recreational trails, which I'll talk just about a little bit about later on. The project included a couple of things in terms of what we call community involvement. There was an early public information meeting and a presentation to the council, which we're making today. There were actually two of those. There was one early in the project and one late in the project. We were going to come to the council and then go to the public in a general information meeting to provide input, an opportunity for input from the general public about the project and things that we were considering and then later things that we had detailed for their consideration and final comment. The project team felt like that that was not sufficient for this project, so we added a third item, which we've listed here as early stakeholder contact. Prior to coming to you, we've gone out there and met with a number of the stakeholders on the project to gain some insight into their concerns, their issue, and their perspective on what the project should be accommodating and what we should be including in trying to make the road a safer road to drive on. Some development issues that we'll be getting into, maintenance of traffic, obviously a big concern. It's an important issue in the project. Our intent, our goal at this stage is the project will maintain two lanes of traffic in both directions during the construction of the project. We feel like that's a very important goal for this project. Utility relocations are extremely important for a number of reasons, partly because we, we believe that based on the information we have, we're going to have to relocate and reconstruct approximately one mile of that stone wall out there along the west side of the road. And to do that, we need to make sure we coordinate the utility relocations with that work. We're also going to be coordinating the landscaping with respect to utilities so that we can find the best place to put the utilities with respect to the existing landscaping and where we can put other landscaping back in its place. The last thing is to accommodate reasonably foreseeable impacts, and we've had some early meetings with utility companies to see what they have and what's in the works. We've also met with Lextran to look at their existing bus stops out there on the route, look at ways that we can enhance those bus stops in terms of where they're at and where they uh, are with respect to the widened roadway section. Recreational trail, I mentioned that was not part of our project, but early on in some of our early stakeholder contacts, it became obvious we need to look at how the recreational trail could get from one side of Newtown Pike to the other. So essentially what we did, we developed a preliminary concept study to look at the opportunities for coming across basically from the road that goes into the Lexmark property from Newtown Pike over to the Bluegrass Mental Health property on the opposite side. There are three basic options that we looked at, one over, one under, and one along the road to the Citation Boulevard intersection. We actually looked at two options for going over, two options for going under, and then one option along the east side of the road to the Citation Boulevard intersection. Just briefly, the two options over uh, would require bridges in the range of 180 to 190 feet in length, the grades would be approximately 2 to 10 percent, what we called alternate 4, which is the one closest to the Bluegrass Mental Health property. And I'll try to indicate that this is the one closest to the property, or this is the Bluegrass Mental Health property. This option has slightly steeper grades because of getting up to the elevation of that Bluegrass Mental Health property and crossing over. The other option, I think, was about 8 percent. Either of these options would have no major effect on the Newtown Pike widening project uh, that it could be accommodated with or without. Uh, we also looked at two underpass options, one of which we have Cane Run Creek crossing right here. We looked at a parallel structure to that skewed culvert. We also looked at another culvert crossing a little further up the hill. 
Uh, those would require tunnels in the range of 150 to 190 feet in length, grades of approximately 1 to 10 percent, with alternate 2 having the slightly steeper grade of 10 percent. Uh, alternate 3, the one closest to the Cane Run Creek culvert to Cane Run Creek, we were looking at setting at the bottom of that culvert for the underpass approximately three and a half feet above Cane Run Creek. Would not get it out of the 100-year flood, but would, it, would get out of normal 25-year type flooding events. Uh, culvert for the other option up here closest to the Bluegrass Mental Health property would be uh, a slightly higher elevation simply because of the terrain. The difficulty with the underpass options is that the existing clearance over the culvert that carries Cane Run Creek under Newtown Pike is very shallow, and to do either of these two options would require raising the grade of the existing and proposed Newtown Pike anywhere from two to six feet. So it would make it extremely difficult from the standpoint of maintenance of traffic and also from a cost perspective to actually add these culverts with that, that condition. The third option was looking at a trail basically from the entrance into the Lexmark property opposite Nandino Boulevard along the east side up to uh, Citation Boulevard and then crossing over and tying in with the recreational trail that you already have underway or planned for on the, the west side. The grades would be approximately 2 to 8 percent. The length would be approximately 2,600 feet. Um, this would need to be coordinated with the Newtown Springs development. They actually have a 75-foot landscape easement that, from our indication, they had planned to potentially accommodate a trail or a bike path of some sort within that area already. This would not, this alternate would not have any significant effect on the Newtown Pike project. There would be some coordination issues. With that, uh, these are the various intersections on the project. I'm not going to go each, into each one of them. I am going to take just a moment of your time and highlight one in particular, which is Olivia Lane. Olivia Lane is just uh, about 400 feet north of the Citation Boulevard interchange, or inter intersection, excuse me. Um, it's relatively close, and from the input that we've had from the Red Cross, from the Better Business Bureau, and also the tenant, or the, the landlord of the um, uh, little shopping center there, as well as the Griffin Gate Neighborhood Association, all of this is, uh, in this particular area, uh, raises some concerns from a safety perspective. And a lot of the people here actually discourage their employees from coming out. So what we're looking at is a comprehensive plan in terms of dealing with this particular intersection, as well as Sugar Maple, which is the next one to the north, that serves as primary access into the Griffin Gate community, and also looking at a possible connection to Citation Boulevard Extended as a comprehensive package for providing a much safer condition with this increase in volume of the additional lane that we're proposing with the project. Let me go back here. The features on the route, I think I, I mentioned something about the rock wall along the west side. This is just an example. I think most of you who have driven through there are, are familiar with the area. There's a rock wall pretty much continuously along the west side with the exception of the two openings where um, Aristide and Citation breached that wall. Because of the widening of the project and the difficulty in options here, we're looking at having to displace this wall, but we're looking at working with the various groups in the area as well as the uh, Kentucky uh, Heritage Council to reconstruct that wall similar to what's been done on the design build project north of the interstate and retain the relationship of that wall to the existing road so that we have a corridor that's very similar to what you have today except with a safer, wider roadway that will accommodate the traffic, bicycles, and, and also pedestrians. Let me conclude by saying Basically, what we found in our discussions and our early work on the project, that Newtown Pike is an important gateway to the, the Lexington community. We know there's some things that the project is going to do, some things the project need, will need to do, and they're kind of highlighted here. We're looking at moving traffic safely and efficiently by adding additional lanes and adding additional features that will provide for safe movement. 
safe egress and ingress for those people along the roadway as, old, as well as those people using the roadway. We're looking at retaining or reconstructing some of the unique corridor characteristics that we have out there, looking at accommodating bicycles and pedestrians. And we're also looking at trying to balance these impacts and costs so that we can get this project moving forward and, and get it to construction as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Raymer. Let me clarify one thing. This would not impact the intersection at uh, New Circle and Newtown Pike. That would be a separate project. That right? is a separate project, exactly, Mayor. And is that currently on the six-year plan? I, mean, I think it is, but I, I couldn't recall. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Councilmember Stevens. Uh, it looks like it will be a beautiful road, but uh, how much land will you have to acquire? And do you plan to acquire it on both sides of the road? Uh, at this stage, it looks like we'll be acquiring a small strip taking on both sides of the road. We believe, based on our preliminary information, that's, a, that's going to be a very minor strip taking uh, on the order of five to ten feet or less. On both sides? On both sides, yes, sir. The, as you probably know, the government has received a grant from uh, Transportation Enhancement for uh, Vegetation on Newtown Pike from Main Street out to the to the uh, interstate, so we need to coordinate that, and, and we wouldn't want to plant something right where you're going to come along in a year and take it away. So, uh, as, as sometimes has happened, I hear in the history of the world. And but if you're going to take more than five feet, you're going to have to move that whole rock wall. Is that right? Or just five people will require you to move the whole rock wall? Well, there are certain portions of the wall that we physically get into and will have to displace basically on the ends in that citation. There are other areas such as along Bluegrass Mental Health where the wall is slightly above the road and by the time we encroach into it, you wouldn't like the, the outcome with that wall kind of being suspended there. So basically as a result of the direct impacts as well as the indirect impacts, it appears the best plan is basically to reconstruct that wall, move it far enough away that you can put whatever landscaping and some of the, the additional features that we've included on the project, such as the bike lanes on the side. Well, it sounds like uh, you'll be taking the vegetation on both sides. There will be a considerable number of the, the existing trees and some of the shrubbery on both sides that will be displaced with the project. As I mentioned earlier, that's part of the reason we have Sherman Carter Barnhart included on our team to help us identify those things that we can avoid. As you well know, when you get close to a tree, sometimes you can leave it, but it doesn't survive. So we're, we're going to look at those things that we can leave and those things that we can't. We're going to look at what we need to do in terms of replacing or restoring those conditions. Now, we have an RFP out for a contractor to help us with this, and who should we coordinate this with? Uh, Bob, Who, or with Sherman Carter Barnhart or with the District 7? Who would be the person? I would suggest Bob Nunley in the District 7 office. Uh, he's got our number. He knows how to reach us and as well as Sherman Carter Barnhart, and we'll work with you in, in, in trying to coordinate those two activities. Thank you. Council Member McCord. Thank you, Mayor. As it relates to uh, the bike trails and so forth, this, as, as you had mentioned, this is the corridor for that, the Healthway North-South Trail that ultimately goes not only from the, the horse park to downtown, but eventually on down to the Kentucky River in Garrett County and becomes a main main corridor and so forth. And I know uh, that, that so many folks from, from uh, District 7 and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the highway department have been extremely helpful with us. And I think for those watching, one of the things that I want to make sure we point out is that we have a game plan for uh, between now and 2010, which uh, has some uh, temporary ways to get across Newtown Pike, uh, potentially at Citation Boulevard, using some other ways uh, down that corridor that ultimately, uh, past 2011, we, we may have uh, a really amazing gateway with, with bridge work and so forth like that for pedestrians and bikes. And so I just wanted to make sure that as we were speaking, we, we've been working very closely with you guys and really appreciate the attention to detail that you're giving that that corridor as well, and it's it's more about uh, a holistic transportation plan, not just not just moving cars and a lot more of them, but moving people and, and moving in other ways. So I appreciate all the efforts you all have, have made so far and look forward to working with you on that. Yeah, the district has emphasized very much trying to figure out what we can or can't do with the project and, and make sure that we understand what the trail will be doing. Vice Mayor Gray. Uh, Charlie, you probably don't have this information yet, but are, are you all anywhere, uh, or do you have any estimates yet, construction estimates on it? 
Uh, the preliminary cost estimate, I figured yeah. that, that question may come up. We're looking at about $17 million for construction. That's assuming that we're able to use much of the existing roadway. And obviously, if we're not able to do that, uh, the cost could go up. There's so, a, yeah. That's a preliminary cost. I'm my question then, if you, if you have got costs. Have you got optional costs or alternates on the bridge or the, or the, uh, the underground, the tunnel? For the, have yeah. you, do you have any costs identified for the... Bridging no, sir. the span or the, no, that's we, not separately we, identified? We did not look at those costs because, as I mentioned earlier, that's not part of the project. Okay. We were asked to look at it to coordinate with the trail to see how that might affect the project or how we might affect the trail. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. Anything further? Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks to you all for joining us today. That now brings us down to council reports, and uh, council member Blues doesn't have access to his uh, <laughs> monitor today, but he did indicate a desire to give a council report. Council member Blues. Yes, the second district will not be silenced. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've got a kind of a bookkeeping motion here. First of all, I move to amend the October 23, 2007 Neighborhood Development Fund allocation list to change the name of the recipient of the Elderly Nutrition Program from the Black and Williams Center in Dunbar Seniors to the Bluegrass Community Action Agency. So moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those no. Motion carries unanimously. And then I have uh, a few announcements. Monday, November 5th, uh, Three meetings. The Georgetown Neighborhood Association will meet at 6 p.m. in the O'Rear Center in Douglas Park. Uh, also at 6 p.m., the Brookfield Chase Neighborhood Association, and this is a, a, a new neighborhood on, on Russell Cave, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, all the neighbors can come out and, and, and participate and, and begin to, uh, to form that organization. That, uh, the Bookfield Chase Association will meet at 6 p.m. in the Green Acres Park Community Center on, on LaSalle Drive. And then at 7 o'clock, the Green Acres Hollow Creek Breckenridge Neighborhood Association will meet in the same building, the Green Acres Park Community Center. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember McCord. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of things. One is, uh, again, want to thank all those uh, residents and constituents that are in the 9th and the 10th district that live along the Clays Mill Road corridor uh, as, we're, as we're having new pavement on that. A lot of calls and questions about that, given the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, that road is due to be improved and widened and, and so forth, and it is a major project uh, that's been going for or, or been needed to go for about 30 years. Um, and just for a point of clarity for those that are watching, uh, the portion that's being paved right now uh, would see really no construction until 2013. And uh, as those who have to drive the road know that it's, it's really, really a bad situation. And so we're very appreciative for uh, uh, the discretionary money from the state and from the Fletcher administration to make that happen. And uh, we look forward to all the improvements over the next few years, but certainly appreciate that, that road being a lot nicer. Uh, Friday night was a great night for those of us who call Lafayette our, our alma mater. Uh, Tyson Gay was, was honored there that night, and uh, uh, we were able to be with him that evening. And, and uh, again, the mayor had had Tyson Gay uh, day here in the, the city, and again, another one of our, our standout talents, uh, and, and look forward to seeing him in the, in the 08 Olympics. Um, I want to also invite you all as council members and, and the public uh, on uh, on Friday, November 9th, uh, a week from this Friday, uh, the Jesus Prom is held at Southland Christian Church. Uh, it is one of the most incredible community events we have. Uh, it is a prom held for the physically and mentally challenged, not only of, of Lexington, but, but surrounding states come. Last year there were 1,600 uh, special needs folks with 1,000 volunteers. And uh, we have folks flying in from other states now uh, that are, are replicating this in other states. And I want to invite all of you all to be my guest and, and my wife's guest at, at this and, and come and visit. Vice Mayor Gray was able to come last year, Councilmember Myers, uh, Police Chief Beatty will be there. Uh, and, and for those in the community, if you have an interest uh, in serving in this and volunteering in this, uh, you can go to JesusProm.com or you can call South and Christian Church at 224-1600. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to say congratulations to a constituent uh, 
uh, a family in the Ninth District whose uh, whose daughter did something amazing that I'd like to uh, to recognize publicly, not only today but but at a later council meeting. Uh, Grace Schaffner, who I've known since she was born, uh, is eight years old and uh, just won the state championship uh, in the. Uh, uh, Academy Academy Riders State Championship and is competing in Murfreesboro, Tennessee in the national competition here on uh, this weekend and I certainly wish her well but uh, certainly would like Artie if you can uh, for us to coordinate having her come down because it's an amazing achievement and she's been riding since she was two and a half years old and having a daughter that uh, is uh, is three and a half and, and is riding uh, this is the type of thing that's, that's really neat to see so again thank you mayor that concludes my report Councilmember Gordon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Stevens um, needed to leave and wanted to, me to make two motions. One is to play, I move to place into services committee the issue of speeding on Shinaway Road from Gainesway to Lakewood Drive. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Gordon and a second by Councilmember Beard to place the item of speeding on Shinaway into the services committee. Any discussion? Those in favor, please vote aye electronically. Oops. And Councilmember Blues, you're voting aye. If you will note that as well. That being the case, the motion carries. And the second uh, uh, item is I move to place into the services committee a study of the traffic patterns in relation to stop signs on Providence Road, Colony Boulevard, Romney Road, and Cochrane Road. So moved. I have a motion by Councilmember Gordon and a second by Councilmember Crosby uh, to refer that item to the Services Committee. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote electronically. Those in favor vote aye. Those opposed vote nay. The motion carries. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Brevitz. Thank you, Mayor. Two items. First one is I move approval of the neighborhood development fund lists. Second. Any discussion? Those uh, in favor vote aye electronically. Those opposed vote nay. Oh, sorry. The motion carries. Okay, thank you, Mary. The second thing is uh, give a quick update from the Stream Construction and Restoration Task Force. We met last week with our six-month review of the 38 recommendations we gave from our task force last spring. And I want to give you a quick update. I would say the results were mixed. I would like to thank the Bluegrass Partnership for Green Community for their fine work as volunteers in furthering the areas of communication and education. We made some good progress there. I'd also like to say thanks to the Friends of Wolf Run Creek for their volunteer efforts in posting projects, pilot projects that are going on in our community. That's another win for us. I'd like to also thank Parks, Parks and Recreation did some good work as well. Uh, the other areas, we've agreed to reconvene in another six months and see how we're doing, review again, and, and hopefully we'll see some more progress in that area. And then one uh, sort of tough example that came out of last week's meeting, Mayor, I'd like your help with, we continue to have a disagreement in our engineering department over how much we can enforce our existing laws. I think it's probably time to move that up to the executive level, and I'd like to ask Commissioner Askew and Commissioner Kelly to get together and hopefully resolve this one way or the other. And if legislation is required, I'm glad to sponsor it if that's necessary. Otherwise, I think it's just an interpretation issue. If you could give us some assistance there, I think it would be a big help. Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. and, and uh, We'll see if we can't get your report within a week or two, something like that, to uh, try to resolve that issue. Councilmember Crosby. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple announcements. The first is uh, this Thursday, November 1st, Andover Hills will be holding their public meeting at Crossroads Christian Church at 7 p.m. And then also, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow night there's going to be 
lots of little kids out on the streets and sidewalks um, across Fayette County, so please use caution while you're out driving home from work. Um, kids can get excited, particularly when they're jacked up on sugar. They can jump out in front of cars and things, so just be careful driving through your neighborhoods and, and be aware that there's going to be some trick-or-treaters out, I think, from 6 to 8 p.m. tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to place into Services Committee the traffic study regarding a traffic light at the intersection of Mount McKinley and Man War. So moved. I have a motion by Councilmember Myers and a second by Councilmember Ellinger to refer that item to the Services Committee. Any discussion? Those in favor, please vote aye electronically. Those opposed, vote nay. The motion carries. Thank you. And then finally, I'd just like to say that um, my wife and I did go to the Jesus Prom uh, last year and had a great time and would recommend that to everybody on the council and anybody out there in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's next Friday, the 9th of November at Southern Christian Church from 6.30 to 10.30. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the team effort there. Um, anything further from the council members? We previously circulated a mayor's report with some proposed recommendations. I trust everyone received the updated version uh, that came out yesterday or today, one or the other. Uh, I have a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor, please uh, uh, indicate by voting aye electronically. I'm not having any luck. Those in favor, please vote aye v verbally. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries unanimously. Any, um, I have two individuals who've indicated a desire to speak on matters not on the agenda. Um, Adam Jones, Mr. Jones, don't see him. So we'll move on to Marie Knight. All right, they both apparently left. And do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second. Any discussion? Uh, those in favor, please vote aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries.